Um, so today we're moving from simplifying things with square roots into solving things that involve square roots. And I'm gonna start out really just super basic with the idea of dealing with these roots. So if I said that the square root of X is equal to five, Um, if I've got the square root of X is equal to five, then this is saying what number when I take its square root do I get five? Now, for something like this, my guess is that a lot of you are just gonna write, yeah, X is 25 because you're gonna do that in your head. Um, as things get more complicated, one of the properties that we're going to want to use is that idea that the square root and squaring something are inverses. Meaning if I have the square root of X is equal to five and I wanted to isolate the X by itself. Well, when, we're, when we have something multiplied by X, we isolate it by division. When we have something added to X, we isolate it by subtracting the thing over. And when I have a square root of X, I'm gonna isolate it by squaring both sides. Now it's important to note that there's an equal sign in this problem. I can't just square stuff without changing the problem. However, if I'm squaring both sides of an equation, we're okay. This falls under that, like I'm doing the same thing to both sides, I'm not changing the outcome. And when I square both sides, the square root of X squared gives me the X back and five squared is 25. I know that was like a really long way to get to an answer that most of you probably had already in your head, but let's do a couple that get more complicated. So let's say that I started off with something like two X plus four square root of all of that is equal to four. I'm gonna start off the same way that I did on this previous one, meaning if I'm trying to isolate that X, the thing that I need to do to solve this is to square both sides. So I'm gonna take that square root of two X plus four and square it. And I'll take the other side and square it. When I square something that's been square rooted, I get the stuff inside back. And four squared is 16. Now I can totally isolate that. Oh, sorry, I got a little too low. Now I can totally isolate that and say 2x is equal to 12 or x is equal to six. I know some of you always ask me, how can you check your work? How can I make sure that I have the right answer? So this is definitely a case where I can take that value and plug it back into the original equation to see if it if the sides match up. So if I wanted to check this, I'm gonna look at the square root of two times six plus four, which is the square root of 12 plus four, which is the square root of 16, and that is equal to four, we're good. Keeping an eye on the chat and checking the room for questions, but I'm not seeing any. Let me give you all one. Oh no, let's, let's do this next one together because I just realized something weird is about to happen. Um, let's say I've got the square root of seven X minus three is equal to negative five. We talked a little bit about this on Monday, but this has no solution. And the reason that it has no solution is that mathematicians decided that when we write the square root of a number, it's always positive. 
So there is nothing that I can put in here that after taking the square root would leave me with a negative number. This thing has no solution. So just remember that if I have the square root of some stuff, this is always greater than or equal to zero. Okay, now I'm really gonna give you one to solve on your paper. So go ahead and work that one out and solve for X. Do you have an answer? Anyone brave enough to share their answer? <laughs> no, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's not 10, but I know where your 10 came from. So let's do this together. And I should have mentioned something, but I'm gonna do this not the right way first. So don't write what I'm about to write. And it's not so much that it's not the right way, it's just a heck of a lot more work. So I'm looking at a square root. So in my head, I'm probably thinking, oh, I've got a square stuff, right? Again, don't write this. It, it's not mathematically wrong, it's just a not a good way to solve this problem. So we could take what is written here and square both sides. Here's the issue. When I have something squared, that exponent means I have that thing times itself. So to work out this side, I would have this thing times itself. And now I'm gonna foil it out or multiply it out or rainbow it out, however you wanna deal with it, however you wanna call this. So I'm gonna have the square root of four X plus five times the square root of four X plus five. Now there, my square roots are going to go away. I'm gonna be left with four X plus five. Then I'm gonna have the square root of four X plus five times two. So that's two square roots of four X plus five. And then I'm gonna have another two square roots of four X plus five. And then I'll have two times two, which gives me a four. 
And then I still have that other side of the equation, seven squared is 49. So if I rewrote this, I've got four X plus five. I've got two of those and another two of those. So plus four times the square root of four X plus five. Um, plus four and that equals 49. I don't know if you noticed, but it got worse, not better. There is a path forward to solve this thing, but it definitely got worse, not better. So what I'm gonna do instead is to make sure that I get the square root piece by itself before I take the square of both sides. So if I subtract two from both sides, then I've got four x square root of four x plus five is equal to five. And now I would square both sides to get four X plus five is equal to 25. And I think this is gonna lead us to a value of X is equal to five. So again, there's nothing mathematically wrong about this as long as you have actually multiply this out when you squared it. It's just that it gets worse, not better. Watching for questions in the chat. Um, not seeing any. Let's go ahead and do another example. Um, one where we have no choice but to let it get a little bit messy. So I've got t minus six is equal to the square root of t minus four. My square root part is already isolated. So that's good news. I'm ready to square both sides. What we have to be careful about is that T minus six squared means that we have T minus six times T minus six. Over here, squaring my square root is gonna make that go away. But on this side, I have to foil that out. Now it's totally fine to do it in your head, right? If you can see that T minus six whole thing squared and jump straight to T squared minus 12 T plus 36, that is totally fine. But if you can't go straight from here to here, then for sure, write out that intermediate step and make sure that you're foiling it out correctly or multiplying it out correctly. Um, And if anybody like wants that in slow motion, I can do that in slow motion, but nobody's slowing me down in the chat. So I'm gonna keep rolling. Now I've gotten to a place where I have a T squared sort of equation, which means I'm hoping to get a zero on one side. And then I'm also hoping that it factors. And in this moment, I'm really hoping that it factors. So I'm gonna subtract T from both sides to get T squared minus 13 T. And I'm gonna add four to both sides to have plus 40. And now I'm thinking, okay, I need two numbers that multiply to be 40, add up to negative 13. And I think we're good to go because I think a negative five and a negative eight are gonna do it. Which means it looks like we have two solutions this time. We would have that T was equal to five or that T was equal to eight. One thing that we need to be careful about with these square root equations is 
when we squared both sides, we sort of lost that information that the square root piece needed to be positive. So we should be careful to check our answers to make sure that they both actually make the original equation true. So if I check t equals five, then on the left-hand side, I would have five minus six. And on the right-hand side, I'd have the square root of five minus four. Well, over here, that's the square root of one. And we define the square root to be positive but five minus six is negative one. They're not equal. So this is not a solution. If we check T equals eight, then on the left-hand side, I have eight minus six. And I wanna know, is that equal to the square root of eight minus four? Well, eight minus six is gonna give me two. Eight minus four will give me four. The square root of four is two. These match. That's my only solution. Dun, dun, dun. So far, we've really been focusing on square roots, but just like we've got different powers, like in square things or cube things or raise things to the fourth power, we also have all of those different roots. Um, so if I think about cube numbers, to think about cubic roots, one cubed is one, two cubed is eight, three cubed is 27, four cubed is 64, five cubed is 125, and that's as high as I told you all that you needed to be comfortable with those numbers. But what that means in terms of cube root notation is that the cube root of one is equal to one and the cube root of eight is equal to two and the cube root of 27 is equal to three, the cube root of 64 is equal to four and the cube root of 125 is equal to five. One of the things that's different between cube roots and square roots is that we can actually take the cube root of a negative number. The cube root of negative eight, well, if I'm thinking about what that would mean, I'm looking for a number that when I multiply it by itself three times, I get negative eight. And there is a number that makes that work because negative two times negative two times negative two is equal to negative eight. So the cube root of negative eight is negative two. Similarly, if I took the cube root of 64, I would get negative, oh, negative 64, I would get negative four. Um, Notation-wise, it is important, just like with square roots, that we're able to go back and forth between radical notation and fraction exponents. So if I wrote these same statements as fraction exponents, this would look like negative eight to the one third power is equal to negative two or negative 64 to the one third power is equal to negative four. which also means that we can simplify cube roots in a similar way to what we did with square roots. Um, so if I had the cube root of eight x cubed y to the sixth, 
and I was going to simplify that. Again, I've got different options, but everything inside is multiplication. And because everything inside is multiplication, we could choose to write this as a cube root of eight times a cube root of x cubed times a cube root of y to the sixth. Well, the cube root of eight is two and the cube root of x cubed, the cube root and the x cubed part, those are inverses. And I'm just gonna get the x back. Now thinking about the cube root of x of y to the sixth, a couple different ways we can approach that. One is by recognizing that y to the sixth is equal to y cubed times y cubed. and then taking the cube root of each piece. Alternately, I can think about y to the sixth as being y squared cubed and take the cube root directly. I could also think about that cube root as saying that I have a fraction exponent. So y to the sixth raised to the one third power the same as y to the six over three for y squared. Lots of different ways to arrive at the same answer. From a, we're headed to calculus perspective, really being comfortable with the fraction exponents serves us better in the long run. Um, okay. All of that said, let's look at solving something that has a cube root in it. So if I needed to solve the cube root of three X minus seven is equal to two. When we had a square root, we needed to square both sides to kind of isolate and get that piece by itself. Since we got a cube root, we're gonna cube both sides. So I'll have three X minus seven is equal to two cubed or eight. And I get three X is equal to 15 or x is equal to five. We can do a quick check, plugging it back in. I plug the five back in, three times five would give me 15, minus seven takes me to eight and the cube root of eight is two. So we're good, there's our answer. I'm like not seeing questions in the chat, so I'm gonna keep going. So this solving square root stuff can get a little bit messy. Um, and here's a kind of messy example. I mentioned before on a previous problem that like I started doing kind of gross algebra and it was getting worse, not better. In general, we need to isolate the square root piece first before we square both sides. This is a case where I've got two square root pieces and I'm not gonna be able to put those together magically. So the thing that's isolated is sort of the more complicated or the messier piece. I know it's not like that messy, but it's slightly messier. So I'm gonna leave that one over here and square both sides. When I square both sides, we're just gonna to have to be careful on the right-hand side that squaring this means I'm multiplying the square root of X minus three times another square root of X minus three.
Go ahead and foil out the right hand side for me on your paper. Our left hand side will just be x minus nine, but what do we get on the right hand side there? And that's my stall tactic because I really need to drink water and I didn't bring my cup today. So foil out that right hand side. I'm thinking that might have been enough time. So when I do the right hand side here, the square root of x times the square root of x is going to give me an x. And then I'll have a square root of x times negative 3 and another negative 3 square root x. And a negative three times negative three would give me positive nine. Well, it did get messy, but we went from something that had two pieces with square roots to something that secretly only has one piece with a square root if I combine these like terms. Um, so, I'm going to do this in two steps. So over here, I've got the x plus 9. And then a total of negative 6 square roots of x. Since I still have a square root, I want to isolate that square root piece and push everything else to the other side. So if I isolate that square root piece, I'm going to end up subtracting x, which is nice because now those are going away on the left-hand side. And I'm going to subtract 9. When I do that, I'm going to be left with negative 18 on the left is equal to negative 6 square roots of x. I don't want to square 18. So I'm going to choose to make the number smaller first. I'm going to divide both sides by negative 6. So that I have three is equal to the square root of X. And now I bet you can just tell me that X is equal to Yeah, X is equal to nine. And we can do a quick check, plug it back in. Nine minus nine is zero. Okay, that's fine. As long as the other side is also zero. Square root of nine is three and three minus three is also zero. So it works. Good deal. How am I doing for time? Okay. So there was a request and I wanna make sure that I've got time to deal with it. So there was a request to take a look at one of the problems from scrolling back up in the chat. I think we're talking about quiz seven to do today. Um, and I am totally happy to go over the question. So um, from the graph problem from the quiz. So there are actually two sort of graphing problems on the quiz. Um, but I'm guessing the question is about the first one. And if I'm wrong, you should let me know. Oh, finding the, the second one, actually. Okay, so finding the solution from a graph, sure. Um, so just generally, um, finding the solution to a system of equations graphically 
means find the point or points where they intersect. So if I had a graph and I don't know how well you can see my grid, but there are tiny dots on my graph paper. So I'm doing this carefully. Um, in case you can't see the dots on my graph paper, I'm gonna help them stand out a little bit. So I'm gonna do this for a random thing. And I'm gonna say, I've got something this is not a line, obviously. But let's say that I had something that looked like that. And something that looks, yep, I've got a parabola. So this one's a parabola. And I'm going to draw in this line. Now I have not given us the equations of either of these, but I can still answer the question of find the solutions. So the solutions are the places where the graphs intersect. So they're intersecting right here. And based on the grid, I can see that that's at an X value of negative one and a Y value of positive one. So this is one of the solutions would be negative one comma one. For this thing that I've graphed, my other solution here, these are intersecting at an X value of two and a Y value of one, two, three, four. So the other solution would be two comma four. So the one on the quiz is two lines, but the same idea stands. Finding the solution means look for the place where they intersect and then use the grid to determine the coordinates. Um, and then for the first question on the quiz, graphing lines, if you need a review from, if you need a review on graphing lines, I wanna say that's chapter three. Um, so go back and look at the stuff from the chapter on graphing lines to graph both of them. Now, I know that I mentioned that in general, finding solutions graphically, most of the time, if we're doing that, we really are going to be using a computer to find those values. And I have no problem if you want to use Desmos to get through the quiz to like graph those two lines, totally fine. If you're welcome to use Desmos, just then make sure that you do copy the graphs accurately onto your paper. Good deal. Okay, we got 10 minutes left. So more funness, more fun examples, solving stuff with square roots. I'm looking at the square root of x plus four is equal to two minus the square root of three x. And because we have plenty of time, I'm gonna let you all try to solve this one totally out on your own. So we've already got the messy piece or the messier piece isolated. So you're gonna to need to square both sides, but be careful to foil out that right-hand side.
Good catch. I'm muted. Sorry. Thank you. Um, working up to this point, personally, I like all of my things to have positive coefficients. So I would choose to add the four square root of three X over here and subtract the X from both sides because I prefer to have positive things. It shouldn't make a difference. So if you did it the other way, it's totally fine. But when I subtract that X over, I'll have two X. Now we have a choice to make. I can either divide both sides by four, but that is gonna leave me with a fraction. So personally, I'm probably just gonna square both sides. The only reason that I divided by the number in the previous problem is because I was gonna have to square 18. And I don't know what 18 squared is, but four is not so bad. Alternately, to avoid fractions, but still make the numbers smaller, you could divide both sides by two. Right, I'm all about options. That's kind of the beauty of algebra is we've always got options. So if I were to divide both sides by two, I'd end up with two square root of three X is equal to X. And I think that's gonna be my route. Now, when I square both sides, remember there's multiplication here. So when I square that, I'm doing two square root three X times another two square root three X. There's nothing to like foil out because it's multiplication, but it is important that that two gets squared and that the square root of three X times the square root of three X becomes a three X. So I'm looking at 12 X is equal to X squared. Since I have something with an X squared in it, I want a zero on one side so that I can factor. And if I put a zero over here, I'm gonna have X squared minus 12 X, which factors as X times X minus 12. So it looks like we've got two solutions potentially that X is equal to zero or that X is equal to 12. And I would just wanna plug each of those into the original equation to make sure that they work. Zero, I can definitely do in my head. So if I plug in zero for X, zero plus four is four, square root of four is two. Three times zero is zero, square root of zero is zero, and two is equal to two. So this one works. If I check that X equals 12, I'm gonna start on the right-hand side first because when I plug in the 12 here, three times 12 is 36. The square root of 36 is six, but then I'd have a two minus a six. And I'd end up with a negative number over here. So this one doesn't work when you plug it back into the original equation and X equals zero is our only solution. And I do believe that with that, I am out of time. Um, don't forget, we do not have class on Friday and you don't have any of your classes tomorrow because tomorrow is a university holiday. So I will see you all again on Monday. <laughs>